Good evening, and welcome to Reimagining Faith in Public Life, a conversation with Rod Dreher and Michael Ware. We hope this evening proves to be a time of reflection and expanded perspectives as we consider how to faithfully identify as citizens of two kingdoms in the midst of political and cultural changes. We want to extend a special welcome to those joining us tonight as visitors to John Brown University. Welcome to campus and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Daniel Bennett. I'm an assistant professor of political science here at JBU and I'll be moderating tonight's conversation. Before introducing our speakers, I'd like to recognize some people who were instrumental in putting this event together. Dr. Tricia Posey is an associate professor of history and director of the university's Honors Scholars Program. She did a lot of the heavy lifting in preparing for today's activities, which included meetings and engagements of various sorts across campus. It was a pleasure to work with her over the past few months in planning today's series of events. Additionally, Glenda Manus put in a lot of work behind the scenes to handle the logistics of this event. Thank you, Glenda, for your help. Thank you. We are also thankful for several offices on campus that provided assistance for this event, including the Division of Humanities and Social Sciences, the College of Business, the Office of Christian Formation, the Office of Academic Affairs, the Office for the Advancement of Teaching, Learning, and Scholarship, and the Office of the President. Thank you for your support. <laughs> Finally, we are grateful for a generous grant from the American Enterprise Institute's Values and Capitalism Project, which helped fund tonight's event and provided dozens of books for faculty, staff, and student reading groups over the past several weeks. We're looking forward to continuing to work with you in the future. And now to introduce tonight's speakers. Rod Dreher is senior editor and writer for the American Conservative and the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Benedict Option, A Strategy for Christians and a Post-Christian Nation. His writing has appeared in a variety of publications, including the New York Post, the Washington Times, the Dallas Morning News, National Review, and Weekly Standard. And he has appeared on NPR, CBS, CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, and the BBC, among others. Rod lives in Louisiana with his wife and three children. Let's thank Rod for joining us this evening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I, I do live in Baton Rouge, and so I, I beg your prayers for poor LSU Tigers this year. We've having such a bad time. And so when I, when I talk about, you know, the, uh, the approaching apocalypse, uh, people in Baton Rouge know what that means. <laughs> now, uh, I, I'm, I'm joking about the apocalypse thing. I, I get a lot from a lot of people who have only heard about my book, The Benedict Option, A Strategy for Christians in a Post-Christian Nation. Uh, it's based on uh, what I think we Christians, all of us, Catholic, Protestant, uh, Eastern Orthodox, can learn from the example of the Benedictine monks about how to be a Christian in uh, a country and in a, a time that is post-Christian. Um, as soon as people hear about this, they say to me, are, are you saying we have to head for the hills? I'm say no, it's not what I'm saying at all. Uh, I do believe that we have to do what I call a strategic withdrawal from the public square, but uh, only for the sake of re-engaging the public square. So we have, I believe we have to step away from business as usual as Christians, not to turn our back on public life, I don't think we have that, that right, but so we can, we can go more deeply, pay more attention to our communities and go more deeply into our faith so we can faithfully represent Jesus Christ in the public square. Uh, so I'm not talking about uh, a total withdrawal, becoming Anabaptist or Amish. Another thing, though, I'm not talking about is, um, is believing that, that Christianity has nothing to do with our witness in the public square and the way we act politically. Um, I'll give you an example. I was at a, a conversation a couple of years ago with some uh, evangelicals. Uh, we were, this was after the Obergefell ruling uh, legalizing same-sex marriage. And uh, we were having a talk about what this means for us politically and religiously and so on. And one of the, the participants got extremely frustrated and she said, 
when can we quit talking about gay marriage and get back to the gospel? Well, I think that is completely wrong uh, because the, uh, the gospel is not separate from our public lives. You know, the gospel has implications for how, what it means to, to live out in, uh, in community. Um, that, that question or that statement only makes sense if you believe that there's a difference, a meaningful difference between your religious beliefs, what you hold inward and inwardly and what you do outwardly. I don't think that's realistic at all. I think that that, that woman's statement was an expression of just how, how tense people get over this issue because it's tearing up families, it's tearing up churches, it's splitting our, our politics in many ways. Uh, but I, I think that there's no such thing as getting away from controversial political issues to focus on the gospel as if it were something separate. The incarnation means uh, that we exist in relationship to all of creation. Jesus did not come only to save souls, but to redeem the world. And whatever we, whenever we're acting in the public square, whether it's in pure politics or in some other way, we are participating in that ongoing act of redemption. Politics is the art and science of how people live together in community. Unless you're a hermit, you're gonna be political, even if you don't vote or even if you don't contribute to a campaign or don't watch TV and get mad at the TV and what you hear on the TV. If you go outside of your house and deal with other people, in some sense, that's political. The question is now, what is the right way to be political for Christians? Now, uh, one, I, I've been involved in politics as a from the journalistic side for most of my life. And I can say without fear of contradiction that the wrong way to be political for Christians is to think of the church as the Republican Party at prayer or the Democratic Party at prayer. Uh, we can begin to answer the question, all right, so what do we do? Uh, by getting straight in our heads what politics can and cannot do. First of all, politics can never be a substitute for religion. We are not going to vote in the kingdom. One of the things that frustrates me so much as a believer is the way so many, and, and as a, by the way, as a political conservative too, a political and religious conservative, it's so frustrating to me to see so many of my fellow Christians thinking that if we just elect the right people and get the right judges on the bench and maybe get the right economic reform passed, everything's gonna be fine. It's folly. I mean, that's not to say that we shouldn't care about getting the right people into office, but that is not the main thing. Politics only means something insofar it is, as it is subordinate to the kingdom of God. Uh, my friend David French, a conservative writer, recently tweeted that it frustrates him that too much conservative discourse uh, is about people looking for political solutions to spiritual problems. I think that is, um, that's a profound statement. Uh, we are simply not going to solve the biggest and most important problems in this country through voting and activism. Uh, for Christians, as I said, politics really have to be subordinate to the kingdom of God and they only have meaning in light of the kingdom. Back in the days of the early church, the, the Romans hated Christians because the Romans rightly grasped that the things early Christians believed destabilized the Roman social order. The Christians didn't set out to bring down Rome, but because they believed in things, because the God they worshiped, because they believed in things like um, uh, not exposing their babies and so on and so forth, they were outsiders and they were hated and they were scapegoated. Um, and those Christians were prepared to suffer for their faith. I believe very much that we are entering and have entered a similar period, not when we're gonna see persecutions in the arena, I hope not anyway, but uh, there will be a time when Christians are, are not understood and are seen as threats to the social order. And uh, I believe we're gonna be scapegoated and we should get used to that. The thing is, it, it's shocking to us because we have been so blessed in this country for so long to have been, had freedom of religion, to believe and say what we think without paying a huge cost necessarily. There have been times, certainly during the civil rights movement, when people, Christians have paid a serious cost, but by and large, we've 
been able to enjoy religious freedom. I think those days are rapidly coming to an end. The good news, though, is that this just makes us normal. This is how most Christians th throughout history have had to live, and that's how many, many, many of our brothers and sisters in Christ who live uh, in the global south and elsewhere have to live today. So um, it's not the end of the world for us, but it is the end of a world, and we had better be prepared for it. When I call for a uh, strategic withdrawal from the public square, what I'm really saying is uh, that we need to step back to reorder our priorities. Uh, I believe strongly in Jeremiah 29, which everybody here no doubt knows that you know, we are called even in our, this exile that we're in, and I believe that it's, uh, being a Christian in America is going to feel more and more like being in exile in the years to come. I believe that God has called us here for a purpose, just as he uh, brought the Hebrews into Babylon as uh, captives for his own purposes. Uh, the Lord spoke to the Hebrews through the prophet Jeremiah and told them that he had a reason for them being there, that they should settle down and uh, pray for the peace and prosperity of the city, because when the city prospers, they too prosper. In other words, he was telling them to be engaged in the life around them. But we have to remember that there are limits on that engagement, and we can see the limits, or at least infer the limits, from the story in the book of Daniel of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, three Hebrew slaves who were so embedded in that society they served the king. But when Nebuchadnezzar ordered them to bow down and pray before the, pray to the golden idol, they refused even, and were even prepared to be thrown into the furnace and die for, before apostasy. I think the challenge, broadly speaking, facing Christians today and going forward in this country is to stay engaged, but also to spend enough time away from that public square in, uh, in our churches and our families and our Christian communities, building up our faith and training so that when we go out, we can not only represent Christ faithfully, but when we are put to the test, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, whether it's an extreme test of life or death or something lesser, we have the strength to say no and to willingly accept suffering for the sake of Christ. That's a difficult thing to do because we're not used to suffering for our faith, but this is the, the challenge of this generation. I think that um, that means if we're gonna get ready for what's coming, uh, a precondition of our political engagement is gonna have to be prioritizing spiritual formation. Not simply evangelism, but formation. Uh, that means added attention to prayer. That means taking up regular fasting, a practice of the early church and a practice of most Christians until the last uh, few hundred years. Uh, that will mean uh, Bible study, greater attention to Bible study and building community, uh, thickening our ties to community within our churches, our Christian schools and, and what have you. Uh, this is like the monks, the, the Benedictine monks. They um, believe that everything they do internally within the monastery to, uh, to glorify God and to build their community will have benefits for those who live outside and around the monastery. Uh, in fact, I, I should say that, uh, give you a little background if you don't know about the Benedictines, they, uh, they arose out of the ruins of the Roman Empire. Uh, when, when Rome fell in the year 476, that was four years before a young Christian named Benedict was born in a town called Nursia in uh, the Italian, central mountains of Italy. Um, Benedict was born to a Christian family who sent him down to the city of Rome to complete his education when he was around 18 or 19. When Benedict got to Rome, he saw a city that was in chaos. It was governed by the barbarians, but uh, insofar as that means government. Uh, but uh, the students in particular were really decadent and, and uh, vice-ridden, and um, he didn't want to deal with it as a Christian. So he turned his back, walked outside the city because he knew that if he stayed there, it would be his spiritual death. He went outside the city, lived in a cave in Subiaco for three years and prayed, fasted, sought the Lord's will. When he came out, uh, to make a long story short, he started a religious order that today is called the Benedictines. He wrote a little constitution for running the community called the Rule of St. Benedict. And uh, it's not a book of great spiritual wisdom, it's just a very meat and potatoes book for how to live together in vowed Christian community. 
he called the monastery a school for the Lord's service, and he was very serious about it. These, by the time he died in the year 540, 547, sometime around there, Benedict had founded 12 monasteries and the mother house on Mount Monte Cassino in south of Rome. He could not have foreseen what his little mustard seed of faith would do because the Benedictine order spread wildly throughout Western Europe, which was, not, which was governed by barbarian tribes here and there. And these monasteries, as they established monasteries across Western Europe, those monasteries became sources, uh, strongholds of light and order and faith. Uh, they evangelized people, they, de they educated people, and they also, within those monasteries, kept records, slowly, slowly copying scripture, copying the works and the letters and the treatises of the church fathers, and even some pagan literature like poems and things like that, as kind of a time capsule. So Western civilization, so much of what we know about what it was like before the fall of Rome comes to us thanks to the Benedictines, to the work of cultural memory they tirelessly and quietly uh, uh, carried out in their monasteries. And so eventually, 300 years later, they laid the groundwork for the refounding of Western civilization. They didn't do it because St. Benedict said, I'm gonna save Rome, I'm gonna save the West from the barbarians. They accomplished it because Benedict said, how can I serve the Lord most effectively right here, right now in these conditions? And God did a mighty work through them. I believe, that's kind of a digression there, but I believe that this is the kind of model that we need to look to even though we're not called to live in a monastery, we're called to be in the world, but we need to look to the discipline, the prayer disciplines, the fasting, and the ordered community that those monks established in those days and that are still going on around the world um, for an example of how we can, we can get ideas to be creative to do that our, ourselves. Um, I also think we should pay attention to something that I call, or I, 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 I hear called anti-political politics. It was, that word comes from Václav Havel, who was the Czech, famous Czech dissident and the, became the president of a free Czechoslovakia after the fall of the Iron Curtain. Havel uh, was not a Christian. Most of the Czech dissidents in his circle weren't believers. There was one who was, a guy named Václav Benda. But um, they were banned from politics because they stood against the communist government. But Havel said that that didn't excuse uh, dissidents from being to participate in public life. They had to work within the limits they were given, but Havel said any act that you do uh, in public that is an act of honesty and truth and integrity is a form of politics. It's anti-political because the politics, the formal political system in Czechoslovakia was completely controlled by the communist, but it was still important and it still made a difference. Uh, I interviewed a man, a historian, who is a historian of the Czech resistance movement. That man told me that every single one of those dissidents never expected to live to see the end of communism. They just did their, their small resistance, doing things like educating um, young people in underground literature classes, simple things like that to keep the culture alive, keep cultural memory alive. They did it because it was the right thing to do, and it made all the difference in the world. Um, I think that this is the main way we will be Christ to the world as believers in, in the public square in the years to come, because politics uh, itself, uh, Republican, Democrat, partisan politics, has become so stiff, so alienating, so off-putting, and so, frankly, inhuman that I, I think that many of us who become too discouraged by uh, standard political involvement will look to things like working in local schools, working in the local soup kitchen, doing all kinds of creative things to strengthen local community and put roots down in this period of turmoil we're entering. Just this past weekend, I was listening to Senator Ben Sass give a speech at a Christian conference. He's a Nebraska Republican, and he didn't speak about politics once, but he did tell this audience of Christian philanthropists that we are entering a time of great turmoil. It's not going to slow anytime soon. Uh, the economy is going to become more and more um, uncertain. Uh, technology is going to be driving a lot of things. Everything that we think of as being um, solid is going to melt into air. That's not exactly how we put it, but that's, that's what he was saying. And so what do we do as Christians? As Christians, he said, we need to help people 
who are, will be suffering from the breakdown of family, uh, from suffering from terrible loneliness, um, who will be not have meaningful work and so on. We've got to reach out to those people as believers and form strong local communities, communities of caring and compassion. Even though we may be hated by many, there will be those who are broken by this lonely, cold world, post-Christian world, and they're going to need help. They're going to need a place where they can feel safe and loved, and we have to be that for them. I don't think we can be that if we continue to live uh, business as usual. We're going to fall away from the faith. We can already see the attrition rates or the falling away of people uh, of the college generation now. It's just incredible. It's, there's never been a, a falling away like this in American history that we know of. Um, that's no reason to be scared, but it is a reason to take seriously the cultivation of your faith and the rootedness of your faith. You can't take anything for granted. Uh, we have to play the long game I, um, because what we do now decides the future. I'll close on this and we can get into details later, but I, I think about the movie Dunkirk. How many people saw Dunkirk this summer? Well, you know what the Dunkirk uh, battle was like. I think that we are living in a culture war version of Dunkirk, the church is. When we have uh, traditional Christians, social, moral conservatives, have lost the culture war definitively. I feel that we are pinned down on a beach where the enemy is ready to wipe us out, so to speak. Not literally, but I'm speaking metaphorically. We can try to make this one brave last stand and lose, or we can get on the boats that are coming behind us and go to our metaphorical England where we can, in relative safety, because there's no complete safety, in relative safety, we can retrain ourselves, we can rearm ourselves, we can get ready to go back out into the battle. What I mean by using the Dunkirk analogy is, in that way, we need to step away from the public square in a, to a significant degree for the sake of taking stock of where we are and strengthening ourselves for the battle ahead. Um, I believe that is really the only uh, reasonable way forward in a post-Christian world. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Rob. Uh, next, I'm pleased to introduce Michael Ware. Michael is a writer, a speaker, and a veteran of the Obama administration. He's the author of Reclaiming Hope, Lessons Learned from the Obama White House about the future of faith in America. After directing outreach to faith groups during President Obama's 2012 re-election campaign, Ware founded Public Square Strategies, which helps religious groups, businesses, and political organizations navigate America's increasingly complex religious and political landscape. And after a wonderful talk this morning, he can now add John Brown University chapel speaker to his resume. Thank you. <laughs> Michael and his wife live in Northern Virginia with their two cats, which I learned the other night. Uh, let's thank Michael for joining us this evening. Well, it's been, uh, it's been so wonderful spending uh, the last day or so here on campus. Got to spend time with students uh, and the community here at Chapel and then got to meet with smaller groups uh, throughout the day. And it really was a true joy and especially a joy to be here with my friend Rod. Um, so, so thank you to John Brown University and thank you to, to Dan for moderating and, and Rod for participating in this conversation. Uh, I want to spend my time today talking about three trends I think Christians must overturn if we are to have a more faithful and fruitful public witness in this country. The first is that in many ways American Christianity has become a culture of its own that is self-focused, self-serving, and self-centered. One way to look at this is through the lens of moral therapeutic deism, which Rod identifies in his book. And in politics, well, there are so many exceptions that I hope we'll get to talk about uh, later this evening. So much Christian engagement is fueled by self-protection and parochial concerns. This was made more apparent than ever during the last presidential election campaign season. You can tell a lot about a constituency by how politicians choose to appeal to them. And Trump chose to appeal to their fear, their sense of loss, their sense of embattlement. This explains uh, President Trump's unusual focus on the Johnson Amendment, a provision banning the endorsement of candidates from the pulpit or through the use of church resources. 
Now, I have been involved in religion and politics for a decade now, and I had never heard any mainstream religious leader question the Johnson Amendment. It simply wasn't a priority. According to polls from both religious and secular polling agencies, the American people actually believe there is too much politics from the pulpit, and they do not want more. And yet Trump has gone around the country putting the repeal of the Johnson Amendment at the forefront of his outreach to Christians. Of course, this is a reflection of our broader politics, increasingly individualistic, increasingly motivated by tribal suspicion, but it is particularly appalling when politicians can appeal to Christians uh, in the same way that they appeal to everyone else. The Christian faith offers other resources. We can draw on many places in scripture and in our religious tradition that would help us better understand how our faith pushes us toward the public but let's talk about Jeremiah's message to the exiles that Rod referred to earlier. These people, God's people, found themselves in a land that was not their own among a people who despised them. And yet Jeremiah's prophecy to them did not suggest that they lie low or that they take a posture of opposition toward the Babylonians. Instead, they are instructed to seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. For Christians, one inescapable conclusion of this extraordinary command is that we are obliged to work for the benefit and the flourishing of all people, whether or not they see the world as we do or agree with us in any way. Christians' obligation is not to their tribe, but to their God, a God who cares deeply for all people. And if a Christian's political ideas and actions are not intended toward the good of their enemies, their political witness is not Christian in its character. When it is, everybody benefits. Second trend that we need to overturn is our failure to make and accept, uh, expect disciples. Listen to what Dallas, wrote, Dallas Willard wrote over two decades ago. He wrote, We have been through a period when the dominant theology simply had nothing to do with discipleship. It had to do with proper belief, with God seeing to it that individuals didn't go to the bad place but to the good place. But that developed in such a way that the predominant thought is that a person can have the worst character possible and still get into the good place if he believed the right thing. This disconnection, Willard continued, became increasingly burdensome to the church itself until we came to the point that, as is widely discussed, there is not a clear difference between Christians and those who aren't Christians. The gospel that Jesus announced is the availability of the kingdom of heaven for all who wish to be taken up in his life now. Not when we die, but now. Today. One of the reasons the Christian witness has suffered is that we have embraced a false gospel that says that as long as we tip our hat to Jesus every now and then, as long as we say the right things and put up the right memes on our Facebook page, then that is sufficient to be a Christian. But Jesus is either Lord of all or he is not. And neither the social gospel of the left nor the personal parochialized Jesus of the right is sufficient. Which leads me to my third and final point. We need to reground, we need to reclaim hope. I tell the story in my book about a German psychologist, Herbert Plug. Uh, in 1962, Plug published a series of essays based on his experiences working so this is crazy. Uh, so he's a psychologist. He's also a suicidologist, which um, I didn't know was a career path. Um, if your kids, you know, you ask like, you know, if I ask my niece, you know, my little eight-year-old niece, what do you want to be when you grow up? And she said, a suicidologist, I'd, I'd have some questions. Uh, but up at, he was German, so my wife is German. They can tend to uh, be a little darker. And so he was a suicidologist. <laughs> <laughs> no one's recording this, right? Uh, <laughs> I didn't think I'd get a laugh line at the time that I'm talking about suicidologists. This is great. Um, so in 1962, Plug, who was a psychologist and suicidologist, who had, uh, uh, he wrote a series of essays based on his experiences working with patients who had attempted to commit suicide or who were incurably ill. What hope could these people possibly have or find, he wanted to know. What hope did they lose? Plug discovered that in addition to uh, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, common hopes, sort of 
the, oh, I hope that I get that parking space hope, or, oh, I hope that girl calls me back kind of hope. There, there was another kind of hope, a fundamental or authentic hope. Historian, uh, one historian remarked that one almost senses the surprise of discovery in Plug's account of this, of Plug's account of finding this fundamental or authentic hope. Well, sort of the common hopes are directed towards something worldly, something to be fully attained. Fundamental hope, the historian wrote, is not directed toward anything that one could have, but rather has something to do with what one is. There's another finding from Plug's work that is valuable for our discussion, a, a finding the historian noted as well, and that is the troubling idea that real hope, or fundamental hope, only comes once our little hopes are proven to be insufficient or flat out false. It is when our little hopes are disappointed that we find ourselves situated between the harshness of despair and the daunting, unusual existence of an authentic hope. The quote is now familiar to us. I uh, used to uh, read it when I was in the Oval Office. It's printed uh, alongside the, the carpet under the previous president. Uh, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Again, it's, it's common now in our political dialogue used to bless a whole range of political solutions. The sentence is often attributed to Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., but King was actually quoting another clergyman. The phrase was not original to King. Uh, he was quoting Theodore Parker, and Parker wrote in the early 19th century that from what he could see, that arc, quote, bends toward justice and reminds readers that things refuse to be mismanaged long. Jefferson trembled when he thought of slavery and remembered that God is just. Ere long, all America will tremble, Parker wrote. King, a century later, used a version of the phrase in a small Christian newsletter. But what remained constant was its connection to the initiative and involvement of God. In context, King wrote, those of us who call the name of Jesus Christ find something at the center of our faith which forever reminds us that God is on the side of truth and justice. Good Friday may occupy the throne for a day, but ultimately it must give way to the triumphant beat of the drums of Easter. Evil may so shape events that Caesar will occupy a palace and Christ a cross, but that same Christ will rise up and split history into AD and BC so that even the life of Caesar must be dated by his name. And then, and only then, after he had said all of that about what Jesus had done in history and is still doing today, then and only then could King write, yes, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The idea was only intelligible to King when joined with confidence in Christ and in God's nature and faithfulness. The arc of the moral universe does not bend toward justice because of a political program or the unassailable motives of humans, but because of a God who wills justice. History, then, is not about human progress, but as one theologian put it, about God breaking into human history to establish his reign and to advance his purposes. If we get this right, if we understand that our hope must be in Christ, then that opens up for us the possibility to hope for all kinds of things. If our hope is in Christ, in Christ, that opens up possibilities for us to hope for all kinds of things. But Christians need to understand that it is not safe to engage in politics with their feet planted in politics. The safest place to engage in politics is with our feet planted in the gospel, with our hope planted in the faithfulness of an ever-faithful, always-faithful God. The future of the Christian faith in public life has to spring forth from holistic discipleship, oriented toward love of neighbor, and grounded in real hope, keeping our eyes on the prize, not being deterred by the challenges that lie ahead. I'm looking forward to the rest of uh, tonight's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to now turn to a time of moderated questions and answers here on the stage. Uh, after we're done with this, we're going to turn it over to the audience. Uh, hopefully, you'll have some questions uh, for uh, one or both of our uh, guests tonight. As we near the end of our moderated time, I'll let you know so you can start lining up behind the microphone there in the, the center aisle. Um, uh, the first question I'd like to throw out to both of you, Rod, you'd mentioned this 
in your remarks a, a bit, uh, but in the months since their respective publications, I imagine that you have seen or read uh, some mischaracterizations or misunderstandings uh, from, from both of your books. And so I'm curious as to what those misunderstandings have been, maybe the biggest or most frustrating misunderstanding, and uh, how, you would re how you respond to that. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I started my remarks tonight by trying to get that out of the way because it has been overwhelmingly the most um, frustrating reaction to me. People hear me talking about monks and monasteries and retreat and they think I'm saying we've got to head for the hills. What's been particularly interesting to me though, and I, I've learned a lot from this, is how evangelical readers of my book respond to that. I was... Uh, never an evangelical. I was raised in sort of, we weren't big churchgoers when I was a kid, but we were mainline Protestants. Uh, I came to Christ as an adult, as a Roman Catholic, was a very fervent Catholic for many years, um, and am now an Eastern Orthodox Christian. So I had no experience of fundamentalism. And for me, my whole uh, childhood faith formation and afterwards was uh, in, a, in a condition in which I was desperate for more structure more depth, more discipline. So, because uh, I had none of it, it was all loosey-goosey. So uh, I did not really appreciate how damaging it could be to go far to the other side. And that's one thing I've learned uh, in talking to people in the reaction to my book. But uh, I, I do believe that the church can err when it is too open to the world, that we let anybody come in, uh, in the sense of, come in and dwell among us and we don't expect anything of them, we don't expect them to change, uh, just to, to sit here and, uh, and I'll explain what that means in monastic terms in a second, but it also certainly errs when we're too closed in on ourselves and we're not paying attention to the world outside of, uh, of ourselves. Uh, the monks in Norcia in Italy, in St. Benedict's hometown, I went to visit some monks there, they helped me understand it this way. Uh, they believe in hospitality. Uh, it's one of the commands that St. Benedict gives his monks in his rule. You are to receive guests as if they were Christ. But there's a limit there. They can't leave the door wide open for people to come in and set up camp there and interfere with the life of the monastery, the monastic community. Because the monks believe that if they do not fulfill their their um, obligation uh, as monks living by the rule, then they're not gonna be of any use to people outside who come to them for spiritual counsel and so forth, and they're certainly not gonna be faithful to God. So that's a really important thing. We're, because we're not called to live in a monastery, of course we have to be more open than monks, but it's also the case that being open to the world in terms of, uh, not in terms of welcoming people into the church, you always have to do that, but in terms of our, uh, what we hold to be true and the way of life, the disciplined way of life within the church, we have to only welcome people in so far as they will join us on this pilgrimage to Jesus in the way we've been given in our own traditions. So that's what I'm saying to people, only withdraw from the world insofar as we need to, to strengthen uh, our, our faith, to deepen our roots in tradition, and to strengthen our ties to each other so we are not so quick to be conformed to the world, but rather we can be a blessing to the world by bringing Christ to it. You know, I'll, I'll just say, um, it's not been, well, what's been fascinating and I guess what I should have assumed or expected. Um, in some ways, my book is an exercise in building mutual empathy. Uh, sort of the, one of the main ideas of the book was uh, I wanted to help uh, 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 religious conservatives understand um, that even in, the, the in policy areas where they disagreed with uh, some of the actions President Obama took, um, that the motivation wasn't uh, direct animus, that there weren't people in the White House waking up every day saying, you know, how do I destroy the church today? That there were real substantive disagreements that had, have to be wrestled with on a substantive level. So I wanted them to understand even, uh, you know, I have a chapter on the uh, HHS contraception mandate, for instance, and, and, and that is something where there are real sincere disagreements um, I, I've, I've, since I've come out, I, I have some, I had some deep concerns about the HHS mandate, but it's important to recognize uh, that wasn't driven by um, uh, uh, 
uh, the aim there wasn't to restrict religious freedom. The aim there was to expand access to contraception, and there was, I think, a, a mistaken view of how much deference should be given to religious freedom in that context. And so I wanted to build uh, empathy on that side. And then I wanted to help Democrats understand that you can't sweep all religious criticism of, uh, or all criticism at all of the president under the uh, rug of uh, uh, just partisanship or animosity towards the president, that there were real, sincere, legitimate policy disagreements that, um, that, that have to be wrestled with. And so uh, a lot of people who have come to the book have done that, uh, but I've also found particularly as folks are writing about the book, uh, if they're a conservative outlet, they tend to pick out all the pieces in the book where I criticize <laughs> the president or criticize Democrats, and if it's a liberal outlet, it's like those, pe those pieces of the book didn't even exist. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, for me, it was a reaffirmation of um, just how tribal our politics has become and, and um, the, the fact that we need to continue to make creative efforts to, to break down some of those silos. Speaking of the tribal nature of politics, you were writing your books uh, in the midst of the 2016 presidential campaign. I don't know when you started to write your books, but uh, certainly a good portion of it was being written during the campaign. And the, um, I imagine that, I don't, I'm not gonna assume, but I imagine both of you assumed a certain outcome to the presidential election that did not happen, uh, in case anyone didn't know. The election was different than a lot of people expected. Um, <laughs> So I'm curious as to how the outcome of the what happened. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Yeah, just look it up. It's on Twitter somewhere. Um, <laughs> it is. Uh, I'm curious as to how each of you, if you have uh, reevaluated the arguments or the positions in your book in light of the election, uh, specifically in light of the presidency of Donald Trump. Well, I, I had my book was completed. The manuscript was finished and locked in mid-October of 2016. And I had assumed, all my, my publisher assumed, that Hillary was gonna win. We had to go in there on the day after the election and do some fancy rewriting of the politics chapter. Um, and what I, what I ended up saying, and I, I believe this even more fervently now that we've been, what, eight or nine months to the Trump presidency, is that Christians cannot think that having elected Donald Trump and not Hillary Clinton, who in my view is an enemy of religious liberty as I see it, we can't think that having elected Trump, whew, we dodged that bullet. I mean, at best, at best, this is gonna be a temporary respite for us um, because the culture is moving away from what religious conservatives like me believe and is not moving in the direction of religious liberty. And Donald Trump has done very little for that. Even if he were a saint and he appointed the best Supreme Court justices, and I, I hope he does, I'm happy we have Gorsuch, he's still not gonna be able to turn around this, this immense tide, this tsunami of, um, of, of pro cultural progressivism and permissivism that has been building for a very long time. I tend to think Donald Trump is not a cure for anything, but he's actually a symptom. Um, and I also blame the Republican Party for for Donald Trump in this sense, and I say this as a conservative. Uh, I'm not a Republican, I became an independent, but I am a conservative who usually votes Republican. Um, Donald Trump came from somewhere. He came from somewhere because the, the establishment Republicans in Washington had been ignoring for so long the pain and the, and the, the problems of a lot of people in their base. And uh, if there had been a more responsible uh, Republican politician who had spoken as directly as Donald Trump did to those problems, the problems of dispossession, the problems of job loss, and so on and so forth, maybe we wouldn't be in this condition. But w here we are. And uh, I, would, I wish I could say the Republican Party was learning from Trump in the sense of learning to move more, be more responsive to some of these populist issues that Trump ran on. I don't see that a a as happening. I would just tell my fellow believers, don't, don't rest easy just because we have a Republican in the White House and Republicans run in Congress. Uh, we cannot think, we cannot be tempted to think that there are political solutions to these 
deep cultural and religious problems. And insofar as we do, we do lull ourselves into complacency, it's really going to come back to bite us because Trump's not going to live forever. And I think the damage that he's doing, the unnecessary damage to the body politic, uh, is going to be paid back in enormous recriminations against believers. I'll, I'll end with this. I was at a, a conference of conservative evangelicals in Washington earlier this year, and um, uh, somebody I know, he works high up in a ministry, just shook his head and said, we, conservative evangelicals, white conservative evangelicals, are going to be the last ones left standing by Donald Trump, and he's going to take us down with him too. I hope that doesn't happen, but I, could see, I, I can see a very distinct possibility. Yeah, yeah. Um, so a, a major, you know, uh, part of that, the reason why I thought it was important to build that empathy is because um, I wrote the book understanding that there was a pressure building up among conservative religious people in this country that the left was not seeing and really did not care to see. Um, now, uh, writing it, I, I thought um, uh, principally that it would be a social, a social problem, uh, uh, a question of governing. Um, I knew it was a political problem too, but um, uh, but uh, didn't expect, you know, it was an election difference of 90,000 votes and the votes dropped in just the right places for for uh, for Donald Trump to to win, and so now we have the the social problems uh, uh, um, and and the problems of social cohesion that are brought by this this invisible pressure building, the, the pressure that's building that's invisible to um, pressure building among half the country that's invisible to 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 Democrats. Um, but now it's also a political problem, you know. Uh, I, I I've, I've written pretty extensively. Um, Hillary Clinton did no religious outreach on her campaign. I, I mean, I mean, I mean zero. Um, she did not do interviews with religious publications like Barack Obama did. She did not do uh, an event uh, like Saddleback like Barack Obama did. Uh, she did not on her uh, on her website. There were pages for every single constituency. No page for people of faith on her website, so people of faith, voters who were motivated by their faith couldn't go to their, couldn't go to her website if you were a Native American, if you were, uh, if you were disabled, if you were LGBT, if you were a woman, uh, it's a, you had a page and, and the, the campaign was asking directly for your vote. Uh, the only constituencies that Hillary Clinton did not ask for their vote were evangelicals and Catholics. Well, uh, uh, Amy Chozik wrote a story that came out the day after the election. Um, uh, Hillary's uh, supporters on the ground in South Bend, Indiana, home of the Notre Dame fight in Irish, um, were asking the campaign to send Hillary to St. Patrick's Day Parade. It was a parade that uh, previous Democratic presidential candidates had attended. Uh, other Democrats were going to be at this parade. It was, it was you know, they saw it as, as an event she, she should go to, ought to go to, must go to, um, and a pretty conventional thing. Well, the response that they got back from the campaign, according to Amy Trozik of New York Times, it was white Catholics are not a constituency Hillary needs to be going after in this election. They're 17% of the electorate. And they're concentrated in states like Michigan and Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, which, which had a pretty significant role to play in the election. Um, and so, um, I believe that some of those dynamics are more important than ever, that we ought, we need to be able to see one another, uh, not just for moral, social, ethical reasons, the fact that we can't have, it, here was the depressing, there were a lot of de depressing things about the 2016 election. The most depressing to me was that no matter what happened, on the morning of November 9th, half of the country was gonna wake up and feel like their own country wasn't theirs anymore, no matter who won. We can't have election. We can't have a politics like that, where people feel like, depending on who wins, that, that the president doesn't even represent them, that the president doesn't really care what they think. That's what we have now. That's what we would have had if Hillary Clinton would have been elected. Can can I? 
I think that uh, it's really important, Michael, you and I were talking about this, the response that uh, Mark Lilla has to his book. Mark Lilla is a professor at Columbia, an avowed liberal, who just published a book uh, criticizing his own side for giving themselves over to identity politics. Lilla is an old-fashioned liberal Democrat who says that the Democrats, it's not that they should quit caring about racial justice or LGBT or the things that Democrats care about, but that they should start speaking to, issue, to uh, ideals that bind us, that unite us, instead of focusing on these little niche groups. He's been just pilloried by his own side for talking that way. Um, why is that? Yeah, by as What's happening By aspects left? of uh, right. So his book was uh, endorsed by Anne Marie Slaughter, who's, who was a principal person in, in, uh, in, in uh, President Obama's State Department and other Democrats. But there, there's, there's a look, Barack Obama was the perfect transition uh, uh, leader of the Democratic Party that's going under serious transitions now. They're going under serious uh, ethnic transitions. Uh, they're going under serious religious transition. So we were talking earlier that the Democratic Party is now split up into basically even thirds, a third white Christian, a third non-white Christian, and a third uh, religiously unaffiliated, and a, a, a piece of that third are religious religious minorities, but, but there just aren't that many of them. So uh, Ron Brownstein from The Atlantic, he, th this is how he breaks down uh, the electorate. Um, and and that, that raises significant questions of how to hold a coalition together. Now, Barack Obama was someone who could simultaneously uh, uh, organize in the black church. Um, he knew enough and cared enough about religion to uh, at least make his case to the saddlebacks of the world and to Catholics, we, we had a robust Catholic, uh, I mean, uh, dwarfing what, what, uh, what Hillary Clinton did and what John Kerry did uh, in 2004. Um, and yet, for, for a lot of reasons, the secular third of the party wasn't willing to criticize him, I think, A, because of a bit of, um, uh, uh, they, they weren't going to criticize a, uh, the first African-American president for talking about Jesus too much or talking about faith too much. And then also just uh, Barack Obama was undeniably an intellectual man and so, uh, uh, and so he had that kind of buffer. We don't have a leader of the party right now. And so we have, I mean, right, you, you see last night Amy Klobuchar and Bernie Sanders uh, in that healthcare debate on CNN. The, the run-up to that was like, uh, was like they were from two complete different worlds and they are. <laughs> um, and so we're, we're going to have a hard time um, uh, making this transition, and, and the Democratic Party is in a real, real conversation right now about what the future of the party ought to look like. And and I will say, I, I think, um, I think people are going to be surprised by just how it, how it breaks down, and what voices stand up for what. I tell a story in my book. Uh, Deval Patrick, the former governor of Massachusetts, visited the. Um, campaign headquarters in 2012, and um, uh, uh, so there's, uh, on political campaigns, uh, there's basically a constituency outreach department, which is, uh, they, they do specific outreach to various, various groups of American voters. Um, and I remember an intern in, the, in that department uh, raised their hand when, after Deval Patrick was done giving his remarks and said, you know, I, I'm intern in the constituency outreach department. Um, uh, what is the best way you think we could deliver our message to these specific constituencies? And Deval Patrick, with all of the senior staff of the campaign, uh, so I, I should just say Deval Patrick is, uh, I believe, the first African-American governor of Massachusetts. Uh, he was in conversations for a VP nod in 2016, and there are some people who hope that he runs in 2020. With all of the Obama senior staff, who obviously set up the constituency department, um, he said, you know, I gotta be honest, and I see value in the work that you do, but he said, you know, in my races for governor, uh, I believe that it's been important to deliver this, uh, a message that can appeal at the same time to all voters so that we recognize that we're in this together. And I don't like slicing and dicing up the electorate. And so of course, slicing and dicing up the electorate is what Barack Obama spoke out against in his 2004 convention speech. And so um, people are gonna be 
people are going to be surprised that leaders like Deval Patrick, I'd say even, you know, Keith Ellison is a surprising guy. Uh, the, the fight for the DNC chair was very much pitted as Clinton versus Sanders, but uh, uh, Keith Ellison is a guy who has, can reach out to the faith community, can reach out to the white working class in a way that, uh, that some of the more establishment types can't. So we're, we're just in a very interesting place in the Democratic Party, to say the least, and um, it's a robust debate we're going to be having. We were speaking of the future in, in a couple of different contexts there. I would like it, let's pretend, you know, 15 years, or 15 years from now, we're about uh, five or six weeks away from the 20, uh, 2032 presidential election. Um, so, you know, Rod, you're a conservative, disaffected Republican. I don't know if that's a correct term, but uh, Michael, you're a Democrat. Um, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on where you see the state of the Republican and Democratic parties in 2032 uh, on the one hand, but also uh, where we see the intersection of faith and public life in 2032. And I picked that year at random. That, that's a really hard question because things are in such turmoil. If you'd have said three years ago that we would be sitting here talking about President Donald Trump, people would have thought you were crazy. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, seriously though, it's, it seems to me that anything could happen. I think the both the Republican and the Democratic Party establishments are exhausted. They don't know what to do, and I think the Republican establishment is scared to death of, of Donald Trump and offending his voters. But it's also the case, this is so interesting, what's going on in Alabama tonight, the GOP primary election. Uh, Donald Trump came to the state where he's extremely popular, campaigned for Luther Strange, and Luther Strange is gonna lose tonight to Judge Roy Moore. There was a really interesting piece in the Washington Post uh, last week, the uh, profile of Moore, the reporter went around with him, and people love Roy more because he's going to stick it to them, you know. And that's what drives drives people now. They they the hate of the opponent is greater than the love of anything we have in common. I think that's across both parties. It's not just your party. Um, I would like to see in my ideal world um, uh, President J D Vance running for re-election in 2032. Um, J D Vance, if you know, he's a hillbilly elegy author. He's from um, uh, Appalachia. And he's a Republican who really gets and understands the struggles of the working class and I think can speak to them because he's lived it. He grew up very poor and in a broken family. And he's, an, he's a different kind of Republican. But, uh, and I think that he could remake the Republican Party in a very positive way. He, I remember listening to him on the radio and talking to him personally. He and I have become friends during the presidential race. And he said, look, all my people are for Donald Trump. He said, I think they're wrong. I think Trump is like an opioid that he's just going to, uh, he gives them a way to numb the pain they're feeling. Uh, and I think they're making a mistake voting for him. But Trump comes from somewhere. Trump is at least talking about the things that are really going on in their life, things that the Republican Party establishment has ignored. Well, I think somebody like J.D. Vance, who's got a good heart, he's a believer, uh, he's not naive, He's, got, he's a military veteran, he's got a lot of experience. I think he's somebody I could actually vote for. I can't tell you the last time I voted for a candidate for national office. It's always been voting against the other guy. And um, that's one of the reasons I'm so disaffected. As far as the Democrats, I don't know. I think that we're, we're probably gonna see the Republicans become more nationalist and working class oriented, uh, much whiter and the Democrats are going to become the party of working class minorities and the super rich. Um, well, of course, uh, you know, we'll be in the third term of President Kanye West's uh, <laughs> time in office. Um, <laughs> so that'll be interesting. Uh, <laughs> oh, God help us. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, look, we have, uh, I, I think Rod's right. I, I think we're in, um, you know, there are these moments where we look back in history and realize that there was a concentrated, uh, there's really a junction point. And uh, I believe we're in one of those now. I think, I think that the decisions that the church in particular and the country more broadly decisions we make in the next three to five years are going to have, it's going to be a force multiplying effect. I, th I think they're going to guide the trajectory. 
uh, of the church in the country for for decades to come. And so it's it's very hard to see. I'll, I'll, I'll lay out. Um, you know, I think we have two possible futures. One is after a series of um, uh, presidents that demand a lot of our emotional capacity and that take up uh, and saturate so much of our lives on both parties, um, it's possible. And I hope that the American people decide that's not what I want from a president. I don't want a president who's in my living room every night, even if they're telling me things that make me feel good. Like, I just don't, that's not the role of the president. Politics is not, does not deserve that emotional place in my life. And we'll end up with candidates along the lines of uh, President John Kasich or President uh, uh, Amy Klobuchar, politicians who are effective lawmakers who even if they wanted to uh, uh, couldn't become pop culture icons. Like that's just not the, the direction of their. Um, my fear though is, is that um, this highly saturating politics is just too emotionally satisfying for, vo for voters to reject, which is why I concentrate so much um, on the fact that if we think that we could serve two masters, if we think that we could find our, uh, our security in politicians who tell us what we want to hear and then, uh, like I said, tip our hat to Jesus when, when, we, when we need him, um, that's, that, what, what people need to understand is that the state of our politics reflects the state of our souls. Uh, and and when, we, when we try and disentangle those is when we get into to, to real problems. And it's also the problem with folks looking at D.C. and saying, gosh, uh, what's going on there? D.C.'s so corrupt, such a mess, I don't want any part of it. Well, unfortunately, in the, war, in the system of government we have, uh, D.C.'s corrupt because it's a reflection of what the people have allowed. Like, like the, the, these folks aren't ending up in office uh, because we pulled out, uh, they got the short straw. Um, uh, they ended up in office because they were voted there. And a lot of them are running through uh, methods of emotional manipulation that we're making ourselves available for and that we're begging for. Uh, our problem right now in politics, the average voter, is not that they don't want to be emotionally manipulated, it's that they want to be emotionally manipulated in just the way that suits them. Uh, and we, we, need to, we need to build up the spiritual resources that we're not going to politics looking for that kind of um, emotional fulfillment. Yeah, that's what Ben Sass says, that if you're going into politics for, because you love politics, you're probably not in it for the right reason. You know? uh, I think one thing that concerns me greatly as a conservative, and I bet it concerns you too, Michael, is the threat to religious liberty in this country. The, the, what I mean specifically is the freedom of Christian colleges and schools to run themselves, and those, particularly on the LGBT, a gay civil rights front, um, I believe that, I mean, the, the issue has been decided at Biobergefell. It's not, it's not going to change, but uh, what still remains to be seen is how much freedom the churches, or, I mean, the colleges and, and schools are going to have. And um, the Republicans don't care about this, which just kills me because. You know, people like me vote for them because we are afraid of, and I think justly, of what the Democrats are going to do to religious liberty. But I remember three months after Obergefell, I went to Washington, D.C. to speak at a, a, a Christian event on Capitol Hill. Afterwards, I went out to a private uh, luncheon with some key uh, Christian Republican staffers from both sides of the Hill. And I said, okay, gay marriage is settled. What's going to happen on religious liberty? Because um, this is where the next front is silence. I, f I finally realized uh, after talking to them and hearing their very diplomatic language that the Republican Party in Washington does not care about this issue. They want the issue to go away because they're terrified of being called bigots and the donor class of the Republican Party is embarrassed by conservative Christians and wants it to go away. And um, I think we've seen that. 
I, it's, it's just so maddening to me because a lot of Christians wanted to go away too. I was talking to a, a, a leader of a Christian college in California, an administ senior administrator, who was saying that when they just dodged a bullet uh, recently by um, with an, a, a, an attempt in the state legislature that would have resulted in closing down, basically, and probably the closing down of Christian colleges who maintained the traditional view of, uh, of same-sex relations and sexuality on campus, they would have had a lot of state funding taken away from them and they would have probably had to close. That changed, or that, that didn't pass because the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Los Angeles, Archbishop Gomez, and a prominent black Pentecostal pastor in Los Angeles got involved to fight for religious liberty and lobby the legislature. The white evangelical uh, congregations, according to this man, didn't want to touch it. This is actually happening. This is a real thing. And our side, our if you're a conservative, our side is not putting the kind of pressure on our congressmen and our state legislators that we need to put on them. Uh, the business lobby is twisting their arms, and so far they're getting their way. And the media is not paying attention to this because the media think that religious liberty is a fake issue. Anyway, but uh, I, I'm, I'm seeing this happen, and it, it concerns me greatly because the liberty of the church to be the church, and in fact the liberty of churches to be wrong, is paramount to me, and it's the most important uh, political issue of our time, as I say as a Christian, and we're just letting it slip right through our fingers. Uh, we're going to make this the last question up here, so if you do have a question uh, in, the, in the audience, please uh, feel free to start lining up at the microphone there in the center. Uh, please keep your questions short uh, so that we can get as many questions as possible. Um, I feel like this is a every debate uh, question ever uh, at the end of each debate, uh, but it's not like that. So uh, you guys have appeared before or together before on a panel, I think, in New York uh, this past summer. And you guys know each other from other uh, contexts. I'd like you to uh, share, uh, after reading each other's books and just talking with each other in the past, uh, what you appreciate about the other's uh, perspective on this issue of faith in public life. One thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I, I had the, I had the honor of of uh, helping support and be a part of an event the week of of Rod's launch. And I, I said this then, and I feel it even more deeply now. Um, which is that um, Rod's insistence in the continued relevance and reality of the gospel to the challenges we face today and uh, his, in, his insistence that there are disciplines made available to us uh, through the Holy Spirit, through the tradition of the church that can prepare us for the trials we face um, for this cultural moment and any other. Uh, is exceptionally valuable right now. I think Rod and I are in uh, a pretty pretty close agreement on the import importance that uh, this is a time for a renewed commitment to discipleship and spiritual formation. And I, I think that's strongly. I, I think we we without that, um, I'm not interested in any sort of Christianity and public faith conversation. I'm not interested in the PR approach of the church. I'm interested in what flows naturally out of a life that's, that's, that's in Christ um, and what that looks like in public. And, and, and Rod's book uh, brings that out pretty, pretty masterfully. Well, thank you for saying that. And I, I think when I was listening to you talk, Michael, I was thinking, all right, I've got to find something I disagree with him on. But um, I didn't find anything. And I know that if we sat and talked long enough, we, we would come down on different sides on, on certain issues, but the thing that I appreciate about your work is uh, the fact that you're not fake. You walk the walk, and you, that's it, and you talk the talk, and you walk the walk, because you put Christ first, not being a political hack, which so many people on my side, at least, religious voices, you know, they're in the tank for the Republican Party. They're in the tank for power. Um, they're not in it for principle, and you're not that guy, and I think it's exceptionally brave of you to be this witness on the, among the Democrats now because that's a lonely, lonely place to be. Uh, and uh, no, and I say that seriously. Very encouraging, Rob. <laughs> no, 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 but, no, but you know what I mean. I, I'm serious in, in the way because, you know, you've got, 
because you wouldn't be a Democrat if you didn't believe in some things that are fundamental to, to what Democrats believe, but you also believe in Christ, and Christ orders your, your political affections. And having to make that kind of stand in this environment is difficult, and I, I respect you for it, and I'm grateful for it. Okay, let's turn to some questions from the audience. I know we're running up against 8 o'clock. We'll go over just a little bit, but try to still get out of here close to 8. Hello, my name is Dante. My question is primarily for Mr. Dreher. Um, you talk about the idea of strategic retreat from public life so that we can maybe like regroup and address it in a more important way. But it seems like as a conservative uh, religious person that we, it's almost like we don't have, we don't have enough time to catch our breath even uh, with issues like uh, religious freedom, which you mentioned, uh, such as Christian business owners getting forced by the government either to shut down or to serve uh, issues that that they fundamentally object to. So I was wondering if you both could comment on that, but primarily to you, Dr. I, I, might I suggest to you that you read my previous book, How Dante Can Save Your Life. <laughs> Seriously, that's, <laughs> it's about an Italian guy, but uh, um, yeah, I think that what you say is right. We've, it, these challenges are coming fast and hard, and, uh, but that's precisely why we need to pay more attention and go deeper into our roots and establish a firm place to stand. We need to be prepared to lose. That's something we don't like to hear, but the fact of the matter is this is a post-Christian culture and we're not gonna keep winning. In fact, we're losing uh, some pretty big fights. And that's okay, Jesus is still Lord, but we've got to figure out how to carry on and be faithful even when we've lost. And uh, I think you can only be prepared for that when you've suffered and when you, have, when you know who you are and you're prepared for the pain of loss and the pain of being faithful even in, under constricted conditions. This is, again, something normal around the world right now. Christians in Europe are, are, have it much worse than we do in many ways. And Christians in the Middle East and China, brother, they, they're paying a cost for following Jesus. We have to be those same people. We have to be willing and able to take it without returning hatred for what we've, we, we, we may yet suffer. So the only way to do that is to do the everyday uh, disciplines and practices that form our consciences and make us strong in Christ. Yeah. I agree with everything Rod just said. I'll just quickly add, um, you know, I think it's also important right now for those of us who believe and, and defend religious freedom, uh, for, for us to separate out um, some of the cultural baggage that is entangled in the politics of this and some of, um, some of what we've called religious freedom, which, is, um, which, is, which has been, um, uh, which is really more a benefit of cultural dominance and make sure that when, when we're drawing lines in the sand around religious freedom, that they, they really are lines that should not be and cannot be crossed. Um, uh, instead of using religious freedom uh, as sort of a catch-all for uh, carrying on fights that um, need, need to be carried on on the terms in which they are instead of using religious freedom as sort of a, sort of a, a cover, I, I think um, as I've worked on religious freedom, the way in which religious freedom has been polarized uh, over the last, even the last four to five years, um, which, which, I, which I write about and talk about the causes of that, is a profound concern to any religious freedom advocate. When religious freedom becomes a, a partisan principle, um, you're putting a constitutional principle uh, up for risk every time there's an, an election and, and we, just, we just don't want to live in that, in that country. Yeah, and religious freedom can't be seen as something that allows conservative white evangelicals and Catholics to do what we want. If we're for religious freedom, we got to stand up for the That's Muslims right. for their right to build a mosque. That's right. And, um, and we need to make allies with those folks because, as I said, in, in California, uh, the, the primary um, victim of this law, if it had passed, would have been evangelical colleges. And yet, it was the Hispanics and the African Americans who came in there, made common cause with the white evangelicals and, and protected religious liberty. This is a time to be building those relationships and coalitions, not just for instrumental reasons, because it might do us some good, but because 
these are our brothers and sisters in Christ, or even Muslim folks, you know, they're fellow Americans too. And when they stand for our religious freedom and we stand for their religious freedom, it helps all of us. Thank you. Brett Castleman, thank you for your uh, observations and your comments. Uh, the church was a stabilizing factor as the Roman Empire began to crumble. Uh, and we live in a very fragmented uh, culture today in so many ways. How can the church be a, a unifying and stabilizing factor in our culture when the church itself is so fractured in so many ways? You began to, I think, to speak to it just then, but I'd like to hear you say more about that. Yeah, um, so it, it's it's been interesting the number of secular thinkers who have started to uh, revisit uh, what they thought was going to be an entirely positive thing of, of secularization, and they're starting to see some of the downsides to it. Um, so you had Peter Beinart in The Atlantic talk about uh, basically, the, the, the headline was, if you thought the religious right was bad, wait till you see the post-religious right. <laughs> like the, <laughs> uh, um, uh, Philip Gorsky, I believe, at Yale, uh, I don't believe is, he's particularly religious, but he, he just published a, a, a book about how religion throughout American history up until basically now, and you could even argue, you know, if you look at uh, President Obama's speech in Charleston, uh, and, and key moments even in the last 20 years of, of history w when really the times have called for it, 9-11, major catastrophes, the religious language has been, has proven to be unifying, not dividing, even though that's, that's becoming less and less common. But Phil Gorski says that, uh, you know, throughout American history, it was civil religion, which, you know, we could have critique of as, as evangelicals and, and sort of what that papered over in the church, but, uh, the, the idea that we don't even have a shared moral vocabulary anymore. So it's very difficult to have a, a shared conversation about values, very difficult to have a political discourse um, when, uh, when there's no assumed backdrop for um, or moral foundation for our society. Dallas Willard talks about something called the, uh, the disappearance of moral knowledge. And I believe that's a, a predominant a crisis that we're facing right now. How the church can uh, serve, I think, um, you know, there, there are examples out there. There are examples in, um, you know, P Pope Francis, which, again, we could have their theological conversations, but Pope Francis proved uh, across political party that there is, there is still a moral way. People know when they hear moral truth when they hear it. Um, and Pope Francis could come and both Republicans and Democrats were fighting to get an audience with him, not the other way around. It was a fat, I was on the White House lawn when Pope Francis spoke uh, and uh, people's guards were let down. It was almost like um, Pope Francis came uh, and it was like Americans were yearning for someone for a doctor to come and tell us how our spiritual health was because no one else is willing to speak with that kind of moral authority anymore. The church can still have that voice if it's grounded in humility and actually lived out witness and not just a whole lot of antics and showboating. Like it has, it has, to, be, it has to be genuine, but I still believe in, in a strong role for church and, and faith-based leadership in this country. Yeah, but I think the church has to know what it stands for. And I, I, I'm more... Um more pessimistic about the Pope Francis effect because I saw what happened with Pope John Paul. Um, he came and everybody wanted to listen and everybody loved him, but they didn't do what he said. You know, and, and I, I think that that is the thing to look out for. How are we actually living? Not what are we saying, but how are we living? Uh, pope Benedict XVI said that the greatest witnesses of the church uh, are not the arguments we make, but the art we pr the church produces, the people in the church, and the saints it produces. In other words, beauty and goodness. I think right now, in the, in the time and place we're in in this country, that Christians need to focus more uh, intensely on the, the culture of the church, building up the culture of the church, and being saints. You know, showing love, sacrificial love to our children, to our families, to our neighbors, whether they're Christian or not. This is, I'm more concerned about the church than our politics. 
I, I think in my book I talk about something called moralistic therapeutic deism. It's a kind of a big mouthful of words, but there's a sociologist of religion at Notre Dame who says, studied uh, American religious beliefs and said this is the de facto religion of America. It's not historical Christianity. It's not biblical Christianity. It uses the, the language of biblical Christianity, but it's really just a feel-good pseudo-religion that says God loves you and wants you to be happy and successful, and you really don't need to pay attention to him until you need something. That's not the kind of faith that's going to make it through the trials coming ahead. I think what the church can do right now, instead of trying so hard to save America or the West, is work on strengthening ourselves because we have been unfaithful. And I think God is judging us for our lack of fidelity, for having turned our lives over to moralistic therapeutic deism instead of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have the resources in our own histories and our own confessions and the lives of the saints throughout, and the martyrs throughout the ages and those being made right now around the world in China and the Middle East. We just have to get out of our own heads long enough to pay attention and submit ourselves to, to authority. The authority of the church in the past and the authority of the Bible. Hi, so uh, you talked just now about uh, the gospel and all of that and um, I uh, wrote down earlier when you spoke about how um, the LGBT community kind of wasn't like same-sex marriage wasn't allowed in these private Christian colleges. Um, my issue is that the church presents itself as a divided front from the LGBT community as if people who are a part of that community can't be also a part of the church. And I don't know where the grace is in that for that community because this is a community of people who are hurting, who need help who have been ostracized from the church. I have family members that have been ostracized from the church for who they love and choose to spend their life with. And I don't know where the grace is in that, and I don't see where the grace is in not allowing them to be a part of a private Christian college. So I guess I don't know what your thoughts are on that, really, or I guess my thoughts are should the LGBT community be allowed to be in churches and be allowed to be a part of church and be allowed to be in Christian colleges like this? And I guess my question is, do you think they can love Jesus? Because I believe that they can, and I believe that God is for everyone and has grace for everyone. So I want to know if that is what you think, I guess. Well, there's a lot of questions there. Um, I'll try know, to answer I'm them sorry. as succinctly as I can. No, um, first of all, yes, God is for everyone. Everyone is a creature, is a son or a daughter of, of God. Um, I believe, though, as a, an Orthodox Christian, that uh, any sex outside of marriage, outside of one man and one woman, is sin. We all have sins, and we all we all need. No, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all need healing from sin, and I believe churches have to stand strong on that, but churches have failed. A lot of conservative churches have failed to sh be really loving to uh, gays and lesbians uh, over the years, and that's something that we absolutely have to work on. Um, there are, we have, in, in my churches in the past, we've had gay folks there, but they are there, like the rest of us, as sinners who are there uh, to be healed and to, and, and to learn to, to obey the Lord. The grace is, comes in healing and, and the healing of being able to live in, in chastity. The question of Christian colleges is uh, one, uh, the one of religious liberty, is what, not whether or not gay folks uh, can be sexually active and be part of a Christian college. That's up to each college. The religious liberty concern I have is that the federal government will take away the uh, tax exempt status and uh, or accredita accrediting agencies will take away accreditation from Christian colleges who standing on on uh, biblical teaching and their own tradition uh, believe do not accept uh, gay rights as is currently understood and uh, by the Constitution um, and by the by the law so I think that Christian colleges who choose to stay traditional should have that right and should not suffer 
punishment under law for living out their, uh, their confession. Um, and I think that is the real issue. If a co Christian college wants to be more progressive on that issue, that should be their right too. The government shouldn't punish them for that reason either. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have, I have LGBT friends who uh, sh show um, a greater sense of Christian hospitality, show a greater capacity in spiritual growth in areas where I'm weak. Um, uh, that um, I find it very difficult um, for me to talk too much about a category of sin which I will never struggle with. You know, um, I, I share a historic view of of marriage, um, but but I I think we should I think we should be uncomfortable when. Uh, we're not willing to talk about greed and gambling. We're not willing to talk about divorce. We're not willing to talk, all these things, because we could imagine ourselves struggling with greed. We could imagine ourselves struggling uh, 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 with, uh, or, or uh, having, uh, 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 possibly having a divorce. We could imagine ourselves having, um, and yet there's a sort of, um, it troubles me when people are willing to speak the most stridently about uh, the sins which they could never imagine themselves uh, committing. Um, and so I think that there has to be room in the church for people who are um, uh, people with same-sex attraction. Um, I have learned a lot from people like Wesley Hill, uh, um, my friend Julie Rogers, um, and this is, an, this is an issue that there are political aspects, and no matter, I think, where people are, um, religious freedom has to be important. I, I talk in the book about the fact that, you know, it was a very important thing. A in 2004, when George W. Bush was campaigning for a federal marriage amendment banning gay marriage, he, he never once said, um, uh, he never once said, um, and, you know, the Episcopal Church, which at that time had come out for same-sex marriage, has to have their tax-exempt status uh, repeal because uh, they don't hold an American view. Uh, th their vision of marriage doesn't support American values. And it was it was a very important thing that churches had the freedom to be against the American standard at the time, which was that marriage was between one man and one woman. And I think that I think that we've every time that we've uh, constricted religious freedom, we've come to regret it as a country. And so we need to allow for the conversation in the church to continue um, without the federal government putting its thumb on the scale. Justice Scalia said as much in his Lawrence dissent. He said he would no more punish, uh, punish somebody for restricting uh, uh, homosexuality, or, nor would he punish somebody who approved of it. You know, it's just not the government's role. I want to thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you guys for being here. Sure. Let's take these last two questions. Hi. Um, it seems like in a world today, we idolize the polar ends of our uh, political spectrum. Um, we would rather argue or question for the sake of creating disruption and division instead of unity and empathy. Um, you've talked a little bit about this already, um, but can you um, kind of just respond on how we as Christians can also respond to um, radical ideology? I'm, I'm not sure what, what, what you're asking. So, um, like, the radical ends of, you know, I am Republican, so therefore I am going to take this to as far right as I can, or yeah, the yeah, okay. or as far left as I can, um, almost to Purity. the point where it's yeah. yeah. So how do we as Christians respond in, in an empathetic way toward this? Well, I I'll tell you a very a very short story about what about being humiliated politically and what that taught me. Um, I was working and living in New York City on 9/11. I saw the uh, the first tower fall in front of my eyes. I was deeply traumatized by what happened, as everybody in the city was that fall. Um, when the government began to talk about, the Bush administration began to talk about going to war in Iraq, I was all for it, 100%. Whatever the government said, I believed it, because I wanted somebody to pay. And I remember writing in those days, I was working at National Review, um, thinking genuinely that anybody who opposed the Iraq war was either a coward or a fool. I saw no other alternative. I was completely convinced. I came later to see that I was the fool and I was the coward 
because I was afraid to question my own presuppositions. And I saw only in retrospect that I was so angry over what happened on 9-11 that I was willing to listen to anybody who would allow me, give me permission to, to exercise vengeance. Now, I'm not, an anti, I'm not anti-war in, per se, but I was able to, uh, it was a shock for me to see how I, I thought at the time I was, re, I was being so rational, and in fact, I was fooling myself. So it taught me political humility and not to be so quick to think I'm absolutely right and anybody who agrees with me, uh, who disagrees with me, is doing so out of bad character. And I, I think that's one of the most frustrating things about our politics is that we assume that people who disagree with us are not just wrong, but they're evil. We have to resist that in ourselves. If we want to stop it, we've got to say no to it in ourselves and insist that other people, we have to stand up for the other guy when he's being attacked by our own people. Yeah, just, just, just building on that quickly. Uh, after finishing my book, I moved to questions of um, what are spiritual disciplines, sort of 21st century spiritual disciplines that can help us push back against the spirit of our age and particularly uh, polarization. And so, um, you know, we can be really practical about this. So do you critique your own side as much as you critique the others? Um, scroll through your social media feed and if your last 10 posts are about how bad the Democrats are if you're a Republican and about how bad the Republicans are if you're a Democrat, um, how, how much are you contributing to the discussion? Um, you, you know, it's, it's been, you know, it's been, it hasn't been like a, <laughs> hasn't, let, let's just say it hasn't been the best career move for me uh, at 29 years old uh, to be uh, critique my party at all, right? Like the easiest thing would be to say Democrats have everything right, hire me, please. Uh, uh, <laughs> like that, that, that would be, that would be great. Uh, um, uh, but there's, when, when, you're, when you're able to stand and say, I'm a proud Democrat, and as a proud Democrat, I think the party's wrong on these issues, um, you're pushing back against the tribalism that is overtaking our politics. And, and, and I'll, I'll just say this, um, and I think there are individual circumstances when being an independent is, is uh, a fruitful. I make this argument in the book, it gets the most pushback of any argument I make in the book, particularly on college campuses, and so, you know, uh, I would say come talk to me after, but I'm gonna escape out the back door. Um, but, you know, part of the reason why our political parties have become so extreme is that we actually at this point have the highest number of political independents we've ever had in American history. 43% of Americans are political independents. Because what's happened is people have said, well, you know, I want to, uh, I, I don't agree with the Democrats on everything, don't agree with the Republicans on everything, and I want to maintain sort of my own personal views and feel good about me and not be a part of those parties. And so everybody who disagrees with, everybody who doesn't agree with every dot and tittle of the party platform, they've left. And so the parties are just talking amongst themselves. Everyone who would offer any sense of nuance to how our political parties are operating, they're independents and no one's listening to them. And believe me, that's a, no, I, I want to, that is, Unless, unless, you have, uh, unless you have a column and, and a best-selling book, um, <laughs> uh, uh, both, both uh, from, a, from a legal standpoint, right? So in some states, you can't even vote in a party's primary if you're not, reg if you're not a registered member. And just in a, like, there is no independent vote in this country. So this idea that independents are, like, swaying the parties a huge, no, they, you're not organized, so they can't hear you. Uh, the, the parties need to hear from people internally who are critiquing the party of, as a member. And that, that is something Christians can do because Christians, it's hard for non-religious people to not uh, make their views subservient to the party platform because what else are they going to make them subservient to? <laughs> I, I can, I can I, I'll be very, very brief. I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> There's an answer here in the Divine Comedy of Dante Alighieri, believe it or not, this 14th century epic poem. In real life, Dante, the poet, was exiled from his city when politics was tearing 
Tuscany apart where he was. Family was against family, city against city, the church, and I mean, it, was, it was a horrible mess. In the poem he wrote about this, the character Dante goes into the, uh, the terrace of anger on him where the sin of anger is purged. He asks a guy he sees there, and this is in the poem, you know, I come from a world that's so broken, everybody's at each other's throats. How, give me some wisdom to take back so we can fix this. And the guy he meets, his name is Marco. He says, the world is blind and you come from that world too. Everybody back there thinks that it's faded this way. We can't do anything about it. But God gave you free will. And if you use that free will to resist evil and to do it over and over again, things will change. He said finally to Dante, he said, if you want to change the world, start with your own heart and go from there. I think that you cannot improve on that wisdom. I will just say I always thought the terrace of anger was Donald Trump's tweet timeline, but, but that was, no, was just, that must be a different thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Last question. Uh, my question, uh, as, as I'm sure all of us recognize, in the church there's just been this huge fallout in the youth uh, to where they're not really picking up their parents' faith. It, just, it really seems like uh, the beliefs of their parents or Orthodox Christianity just doesn't really sink past the skin. Um, and so for me, I guess the question is, as a person who would like to, you know, devote my life to revitalizing Orthodox Christianity in some way, you know, what's been missing in the Christian formation um, that we should be cultivating in our youth? I think that the, the, the best answer to that is the, the, re, the truth that Christianity is more than about feeling. When I go to Christian colleges, this is what I hear from professors who are dealing with and, and campus ministers, is that so many of the young people come out of youth ministry and they believe this sort of Jesus is my boyfriend, you know, idea of very, very shallow emotion-driven Christianity. When they hit the real world, it dissipates. I think that um, what we have to do is focus hard on discipleship, going deep and developing real roots. There's so many uh, ways to do this. In my book, um, The Benedict Option, I, I talked to a man who's uh, helped start a community in Italy about this, and he said, you know, and, and it's a, vi a very vital, attractive, joy-filled community of Orthodox Catholics. And I said, what's your secret? He said, we didn't discover, we, we didn't invent anything. We just discovered what was there in front of our nose all along, but we had forgotten about it. There's so many treasures in the, in the history of the church and traditional practices that we can draw on. We just have to look for them and refuse this sort of emotion-driven um, discourse within the church because you're not gonna build a Christianity that's gonna be able to withstand um, persecution or it, however soft the persecution is. Richard Wurmbrand was a um, Lutheran pastor who went to the Gulag in Romania for his faith, was suffered and tortured by the communists there. And he said that there are two kinds of Christians in the world, those who think they're Christian and those who really are. And you only see who really is when you're put to the test. So one, the time when we're not tested, we have got to build, work so hard to build up that deep res reservoir of faith and commitment that will stand us in good stead when we are put to the test. Yeah. I'll, I'll just say I spoke to it in chapel this morning, which is, um, you know, <laughs> This is going to sound like a, uh, there's a lot of weak reasoning <laughs> among young people that uh, we need to be respectful and understanding of the disappointments that they faced. But at some point, we need to tell them, look, the fact that Pastor so-and-so has traded in the gospel for political power or the fact that uh, your parents have disappointed you, um, that, that, that's harmful, and we need to be sympathetic towards that. But Jesus never promised that your parents would be the perfect example. Jesus never promised that there wouldn't be hucksters misusing uh, uh, the Bible for their own purposes. We need, young people need, need, to, need to confront Jesus. And if they want to reject Jesus, then that is up to their choice. But we can't let folks... And these are all my friends, right? Uh, we, we can't let folks off the hook by saying, well, I'm not going to come back to the church until they, you know, really clean up their act or, you know, my parents. Is, uh, like we need to, um, uh, Jesus is, uh, 
the perfect example. And all of the, all of the disappointments out there um, are answered in Jesus himself. Um, and so uh, th those are the, uh, we need to urge young people on to confront Jesus the person and take away some of the baggage and some of the lights and smoke that we have in evangelicalism and just ask people to look Jesus in the eye and see what they come away with. I was, uh, I lost my faith as a teenager because I was raised in a really milquetoast church where nothing really seemed to matter. And I thought I knew everything there was to know about Christianity. This was Baton Rouge in the 80s. I thought you could either be, um, be sort of the middle class at prayer or you could be a follower of Jimmy Swaggart, who was a big evan televangelist then. And I thought that was the only choices. Neither one made any sense to me. I was gone. I was ignorant. I didn't realize until I went to, to Europe uh, on a, a trip. My mom wanted a church raffle and I went to one of the, <laughs> no kidding. She didn't want to go. I was the only young person on this bus full of elderly Americans. But, and the, I just wanted to get to Paris. I'd read my Hemingway. I wanted to drink some wine. I was 17. You can do that there and go to the art museums. I had no interest in God. The bus stopped at the Chartres Cathedral, an hour outside of Paris on the way there. And I said, well, I guess I better go in. I don't want to sit on this bus for an hour. I walked into this medieval cathedral. It was built in, uh, in the 12th century, 13th, 12th and 13th centuries. And I met God there. I was so overwhelmed by the spiritual grandeur of God in the, the lines and that stone and the glass. I knew that I was in the presence of something and someone greater than myself. And I wanted to know the God uh, to whom people 800 years ago built this amazing temple. I didn't walk out of there as a Christian, but I walked out of there a different young man. I walked out of there knowing that, my, that there was so much more to following Jesus than I, as a 17-year-old in late 20th century, small town America, knew. The Christian faith is enormous. It is small c Catholic, meaning universal. Uh, don't think that just what you see in front of you and what you were raised is the first and last word about the Christian faith. Go deep. The traditions are there. I don't know whether you're Protestant, Catholic, or whatever, but uh, I'm not going to tell you which tradition to go to, but just go deep. The historic church is not, does not look like the church does in 21st century America. There's so much there, but you've got to look for it. It's not going to come find you. You've got to look for it. I will, those were great comments. I will say I do love the idea that parents are going to go home and like send their kids to Paris. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, the, the kids will go back. Guess what I learned at college? I need to go to Paris and I'll strengthen my faith. Buy me a plane ticket. <laughs> <laughs> that could be helpful. I know we're over time, but uh, let's thank our speakers for coming one last time. <laughs> <laughs>